Hello, Chart Watchers, and welcome to this Wednesday, July 24th, 2019, Market Watchers Live Show with your host, Tom Boley and Aaron Swenlin. For those of you joining us for the first time today, welcome to the show. And for our regulars, welcome back. Taking a look at the market action today, we are seeing uh, lower prices across most of the indices. Got the Dow Jones Industrial Average down 139 points, the S&P down a fraction, less than one point. NASDAQ, however, actually is outperforming today, up 14 and nearing an all-time high. Uh, the Russell 2000 also showing some relative strength today, trying to get back up above. It's 20-day moving average currently up nearly five points. 10-year Treasury yield down two basis points, 2.07%. We did rise yesterday, get back up above the 20-day moving average. We're now hovering right there on the 20-day. Volatility continues to drop. This is a good sign for the market. A move below 12 would establish a new multi-month low. Currently, we're at 1242. Energy having a strong day today, along with technology and industrials. All three of these groups strong, but the one I'm watching is industrials. If you go back the last two years, you'll notice that right around this 79 level, we have had a number of tests. So a breakout here on the XLI would be very bullish. Delivery services having a huge day today uh, as a result of uh, United Parcel Group. Banks. Uh, actually challenging some overhead resistance from a few months back uh, up at that 460 level, having a solid day, and then semiconductors continuing their role that we have seen since that June low. This is one of the leading groups since that June low, continues to power the NASDAQ higher. Three stocks reporting very strong results um, and getting great reactions here. Edwards Life Sciences, United Parcel, as I mentioned, and Discover Financial, also building on a very, very strong week that it's had so far. All right, Aaron, boy, earnings are flying in. I mean, there are so <laughs> many earnings reports that I'm trying to keep up with here, and we're going to go over a bunch of them in a bit. But so far, I would say the earnings uh, have been pretty positive. Absolutely. I mean, I think that's been generating some of the moves to the upside that we're seeing in, in these indexes. A little, little rough this morning, but I, there's time. There's time. Yeah, I mean, Caterpillar was disappointing, but I don't think too many folks were expecting a whole lot of, out of Cal Caterpillar. And same with Boeing. Uh, Boeing actually reported pretty good results, but their problem is that they still will not provide guidance. And they delayed uh, the launch of one of their new flights. I think it's the, I might might get it wrong, 77X, seven, seven, seven I think is, is there. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, yeah. that's been a problem for them. So, hmm. Yeah, so both of those are weighing on the Dow today, but yesterday it was uh, Coca-Cola and United Technologies that came out with great results, and we saw the Dow pop to a new all-time high, so a little bit of profit-taking today. Yep, I agree. Yeah, and we've got a special guest in today. Of course, it is Relative Strength Week. We are going to be talking a lot. We already have been talking a lot about Relative Strength. We're going to talk about it some more today in the balance of the week, but today we have Gaddis Rose. Gaddis, how are you doing? I'm doing fine. I've been lifting weights last week, uh, getting ready for this relative strength presentation. Um, I think you got the wrong memo. Uh, oh, oh. Well, anyway, it's it's been good for my fitness. <laughs> there you go. Makes makes perfect sense. Um, yeah, that's not exactly the relative strength we were talking about, but hey, I, I agree. I think it's a good thing, and and uh, maybe we can encourage everyone out there to build their own relative strength. Well, then my slides aren't going to be very relative, but oh, anyway. oh. well. Everyone's going to be sitting on the edge of their seats now waiting to see what your slides. <laughs> but anyway, uh, we're going to have you back in here in about 15 minutes if you hang in there. And uh, we look forward to your presentation today. Very good. Thank you. All right, Aaron. Let's get going. All righty. This week, we continue Relative Strength Week. And Arthur Hill and Julius DeKempener will be with us tomorrow for a round table on relative strength. David Keller is going to join us Friday. Monday, we have August seasonality. And then uh, Tuesday, ETF corner, something new. That'll be great. And then Jake Bernstein is going to be in on Wednesday of next week. So great, great week ahead. And as far as today's agenda, we did just uh, introduce Gaddis. So he's going to be doing tensile trading fab four, 10 and 10, PACAR, P-C-A-R. And we will finish with both a scooter report and some RRG analysis on our own without Julius here. So that should be fun. All right, let's go ahead and get technical news. Uh, get, get that started, Tom. Sounds good. Here are a couple key economic reports out this morning. July PMI composite flash came in just below expectations. No biggie there, 51.6 versus 51.7. 
But another disappointing report out of the home construction group, June new home sales, 646,000 versus the expected 660,000 home uh, construction group that uh, index is really teetering at a key support level. Uh, it is below its 20 week moving average. So that's something to kind of keep in mind as we go forward. Uh, and another thing you want to watch is the uh, 10 year treasury yield when you think about those home construction stocks. And you can see today we are uh, actually up just slightly. Oh, well, actually, this is a weekly. Sorry, I was going to say, well, I think we're down two basis points. Uh, but you can see on the weekly chart that I wanted to show you here, we have been downtrending on the 10 year treasury yield now for the past seven, eight months. And we're starting to tick back up. Um, and that is perhaps causing a little bit of nervousness in that home building area. But uh, again, today we are down a couple basis points. I think maybe that's helping the group hold on to some key support. Uh, speaking of that support, I do just want to pull that chart up quickly because this is a very uh, interest sensitive group. And here you can see the uh, head and shoulder neckline that I'm watching right around 780, maybe just below 780. And that's right exactly where we're sitting here. So this is a group to keep an eye on, uh, especially as we watch the 10 year treasury yield. A rising yield could create a breakdown here. Uh, earnings news, I don't even know where to start. Well, we'll start with the slide, but we have a, a number of companies that reported last night that are that have reported this morning. And the pace of these earnings reports are going to accelerate over the next couple of weeks. You can see on your screen, there was a mixed bag. We had uh, s several very nice reports, Texas Instruments in particular, getting a nice response, Chipotle as well, getting a very nice response. Uh, Caterpillar, not so much though, as you can see down there, missing, falling well short of estimates. So a uh, lot to go over here. I'm gonna go ahead and start with um, Visa, uh, right at the top of the list. So let's take a look at this chart. And I'm gonna go through a ton of charts where we have had earnings reports out. Uh, so bear with me as we go through these. Visa came out, beat on the top line, beat on the bottom line, raised their fiscal year 19 earnings per share slightly higher. You can see this has been a very nice performer, especially when you look back off of the lows that were established here uh, on a relative basis back in May. Uh, this uh, Visa has been outperforming and you can see the, the absolute strength has been strong. So I think the market was anticipating a strong report and they certainly got it. Texas Instruments uh, beat top line, beat bottom line. Look at this move to the upside. Semiconductors already very strong. Texas Instruments had been lagging the group, even though it was going up the past couple of months. It wasn't going up as fast as the group until today. Look at that volume coming in today on Texas Instruments. Really good report. Um, Chipotle, another solid report here by this restaurant company. Chipotle Mexican Grill had been consolidating. Beautiful move up today. It's now $47 today, more than 6%. Look at the restaurant group and Chipotle had kind of been consolidating here for a while and as a result had underperformed the group, but it is quickly regaining its strength. They did uh, not only beat top and bottom line, but they guided their fiscal year 19 comps higher. AT&T, not such a great report. It was okay, market uh, cheering it on but they did miss on their top line barely. It was just a slight miss. They matched expectations on the bottom line. They guided in line, but they did raise their cash flow, free cash flow expectations. And I'm sure that's what's uh, helping here. Also off of a downtrend heading into today, you can see that hammer printed right on the 50 day moving average. So I think uh, AT&T is just kind of range bound here right now between 32 and 34. We'll see which way it breaks. Boeing. Uh, Boeing, a number of attempts here to get through 380. You can see earlier this week, back on Monday, we were above it, couldn't hold, came back down. Not ex not a lot of excitement after this earnings report, down almost 3%, down $10 today. The big thing, they in their last quarter, they would not provide guidance due to the max 737 issues, and they continue to not pro uh, provide guidance. And as I mentioned earlier, they are delaying uh, the flight target date for the 777X to early 2020. So I think the market is looking at that and the fact that Boeing relative to the aerospace group is now near a 52 week low. So Wall Street not expecting a whole lot out of this stock and we shouldn't either. UPS, big report here. The stock was beginning actually to show some nice relative strength versus the delivery services group. The problem is the group had been underperforming. 
Now with the UPS report today, look at the volume coming in, the huge move here. Close above 115 would be very bullish for United Parcel Service. That would be the highest close in about 10 months, nine or 10 months. And it's already got relative strength versus its group. So if the group starts to perform, I would expect to see much higher prices here on UPS. Caterpillar mentioned this was a, a problem child today and uh, we are trading lower. Caterpillar, as you can see, has been under a lot of pressure throughout the entire trade war, uh, all these discussions, and this is a very real problem for Caterpillar. And they mentioned it, uh, falling short of expectations on both the top and bottom line. They also guided fiscal year 19 earnings per share lower. Norfolk Southern, NSC, gap down. Now this has been in a pretty good space. The railroads, even though we've weakened the last two months, overall for the past couple of years, railroads have been strong. Unfortunately, we are now seeing a breakdown on Norfolk Southern relative to the railroads that goes back about four months or so. So not a good development here. We got tried to get back up above this 190 level after opening well below, failing so far. I would watch 190 until we can get back above that. I'd be a little careful here. Some other earnings, uh, some other companies in the earnings I wanted to show you. This uh, company doesn't trade a whole lot of shares, as you can see, but it is having a huge day today, up more than 8%. Very heavy volume for the stock. This is CoStar Group. And you can see it is in a strong area of the market and it's a leader. So I wanted to point it out. Right? Really good report there. iRobot. Uh, Want to see what one look, what looks bad? Um, you know, sometimes you don't have to wait for fundamental news to come in to know that there's going to be some bad news. iRobot, I think, is a perfect example. Look at the stock down near its 52-week relative low before the earnings announcement came in. They missed on their top line. They did beat on the bottom line, but they guided fiscal year 19 revenues and earnings per share lower, stock down 19%. This is one of the reasons why I follow relative strength. I don't want any part of these companies that are downtrending. I know it's tempting. You say, well, value is getting you know, really cheap. Uh, the problem is it can get a lot cheaper, as we're seeing with iRobot today. M-A-N-H, this is Manhattan. This was a setup that Aaron had a while back, a beautiful looking chart. You can see the relative strength had been picking up for the last few months, and today they delivered the goods. A really solid report here. Beat on the top line, beat on the bottom line, guided fiscal year 19 revenues and earnings per share higher. This is a stock I will definitely have on my radar going forward. Looks good. CB, this is Chubb. A um, little mixed picture here. The group has been strong, but on a relative basis, Chubb has struggled. They came out, beat on the top line, beat on the bottom line, and actually gapped a little bit lower today, trying to move back up. But until we get a breakout and start to see some relative strength and break this relative downtrend, I think there are other stocks within the group that probably would merit your consideration a bit more. Edwards Life Sciences mentioned this one at the top of the show. I think the problem here, the only problem, is that you can see medical supplies is at about a three-month relative low to the S&P 500. But this has been a great stock. I think because the group has been weak, maybe we're going to see this gap fill. But anything back down below 200 would start looking very interesting on EW. Discover Financial Services, DFS, big, big report here. Check out the relative strength. All of a sudden, we jump up to about an eight-month high. They beat on their top line, $2.98 billion versus $2.81 billion. Easy beat on the bottom line, $2.32 versus $2.11. And you can see it's part of a group that's been very strong and now all of a sh sudden showing its own relative strength. I think Discover is a stock you want to keep an eye on as we go forward. I think there will be uh, some opportunities ahead there. Superior Energy Services. I just talked about, you know, when you look for value, sometimes you just find out that that value just keeps getting better and better, unfortunately. I think Superior Energy Services is one of those examples. Keeps going down. You can see that, you know, maybe somewhere along the way you think it's a great deal. Uh, its group has been underperforming the S&P 500. The stock has been underperforming its group. And today they came out, they missed on their top line, missed on their bottom line and trading back down another 12%. Uh, sometimes you think you can't get any worse and then it does. HCSG, another stock that had been downtrending. Think maybe something's going on here. Well, we found out today earnings came up short on the top line, way short on the bottom line, 24 cents versus 35 cents. Stock down 21%. So again, another reason why I try not to bottom feed. Market's telling us something. We need to listen. Snap, big report here. Snap, uh, huge jump here. Great volume. 
Uh, it's been a great performer within the internet space. It's breaking out again. This is one we want to keep an eye on. Moving to the scooters, I did want to point out this biotech stock right here, GHDX. It's up 29 points, scooter points today. And I think it's broken its downtrend line, started to break that downtrend line with some volume at the end of June, pulled back, printed a higher low, and now breaking out with increasing volume. Look at the relative strength versus the biotechs. Only problem with this stock is the biotechs have just been weak. But we're starting to see some nice relative strength. Uh, scooter, you can see jumping there. GHDX looks good. And it is my scooter mover of the day. All right. Time for some upgrades and downgrades. I am going to start off actually with a stock I continue to own, Kimberly Clark. It was upgraded today by Atlantic Equities from an underweight to a neutral. Um, this one's actually been on my radar as a possible sell because I have a double top forming. I have a negative divergence with the PMO. And, uh, you know, that's, I got in pretty early, so I'm not feeling too bad about it. But um, I'm starting to wonder now that we're hitting this confirmation line, that short term support and the 50 day EMA. If we lose those, uh, I, I might consider a change. But, you know, we got the upgrade, so it'll be interesting to see how that, uh, how that proceeds. Uh, United Airlines was upgraded today by Imperial Capital from an underperform to an inline, and they have moved their price target from $81, so right about here, and they have raised it to $94, which, come over here, is right about there. So we're already above the current price target. They did move it into an, you know, in line or a neutral. Uh, and I, I do have to say, I like the chart. You know, you've got a nice rising trend going on here. Hasn't been broken. Uh, PMO is clearly doing well after a, a nice buy signal in oversold territory. I think this one does have room to run. You could make a case possibly for a short term flag forming here as well. So I, I think that's probably a great upgrade, but at the same time, look at where we have overhead resistance right there. And if we pull this back out, you know, that's a high that we haven't seen for a long time. So I I'm also a little suspect of that overhead resistance coming up, but nice upgrade at this point. Akamai, we're going to look at some downgrades. Akamai was downgraded today by Guggenheim from a buy to a neutral. And there was no price targets to, to, give, uh, to give out here. Um, I do want to show you, let's see if I get this a little bit bigger. There is the PMO, and right now it is topping uh, below, well, not below the zero line. The zero line's back down here. But it is topping and turning down. We could see a sell signal. You know, I can see the possible point in the downgrade. If you want to go for a longer term rising trend, though, we're still you know, doing okay with that. Uh, you could actually even bring it up here to that low. And, the, you know, we're doing all right there. It, we did get into a really tight rising trend, a very steep one. And so it isn't a surprise to see that starting to fail. I'd watch the 20 and 50 day EMAs, but I'm not so sure that this downgrade is completely warranted, at least in my opinion. And the last one I'm going to go over as far as downgrades is Rio Tinto. And it was actually downgraded by two uh, organizations and Credit Suisse moved it from a neutral to an underperform, and Librarium would uh, downgrade it from a buy to a hold. So we have one agency putting it in sort of a sell position and the other putting it in a, in a neutral position. I thought this one looked interesting because we are sitting right here near support uh, on that big gap down. And, you know, we are looking at a four, almost a four and a half percent drop currently going on. I would pay very close attention to this support line. I mean, if you're holding this, if you have it, uh, you know, and I can see why you would, it's been holding above that 50 day EMA. But now we're getting ready to hit that support. I might wait a little bit on this just to see if we get that bounce. But a uh, little worrisome when you look at a PMO that's on a sell signal and continuing lower. It is still above the zero line, so it's not, you know, all all bad at this point. That's all I have for the upgrades downgrades. Here is the list. I'll have these in the Market Watchers recap this evening, and you can uh, take a peek at them then. All right, uh, we're going to head out to a break, but we will be back with Gaddis Rose.
All right, we are back and I have the pleasure of introducing Gaddis Rose. He's one of our senior technical analysts here at stockcharts.com. I mean, he is a CMT. He's written books on tensile trading. So really excited to see what you have to say about the tensile trading philosophy and what you're gonna be doing as far as relative strength today. So I'm gonna just pass it right along to you. Well, thank you very much, Aaron. Well, good morning, everyone. I guess I have to be sensitive to the uh, people in different time zones, but um, the title of the talk will become evident here as we grow, go along. And um, most of the material here is, it's an embellished version of what was in the book, which came out in 2016 and uh, plug, plug the book here. Um, this is the basis of the book and relative strength actually uh, has an impact on seven of these 10 stages, uh, e even starting with money management where you're looking at asset allocation and how important relative strength is in the, in the asset allocation arena. But um, this may seem a little bizarre if you're talking about relative strength, but the first question you always have to ask before you address the relative strength question is, what's the trend of the market? And so, um, that the market as we know can really only be in three phases, either uptrend, sideways, or downtrend. So that's a paramount question, and obviously here you can see there are other questions, but we're gonna focus answering that first question, what is the trend of the market? Um, we have in a chart pack, we have a chart list 10.1, which is called permission to buy, sort of self-evident. And what that is filled with is a number of charts that start with the telescope and go down to the microscope level and they help you focus or answer the, uh, the question, what is the, the trend? We all have different trading time frames. Um, so uh, it's, I, I'm not going to make an assumption that, uh, that your trading time frame is the same as mine, but uh, the key question, as I say, before you get into the relative strength is, looking at these, and this is just an example of uh, a chart list. Um, this is a, an example, again, a chart from the, uh, the chart pack, um, but uh, Daryl Guppy, uh, an Australian technician, has this approach of all these um, exponential moving averages, and uh, it's pretty simple. You can see that uh, the, as the trend changes and the present trend, it's, it's a very simple, colorful, uh, the way the, um, the trend lines interact and compress and expand. So that can answer that question. So uh, this is the chart pack that I mentioned that Grayson and I put out every quarter an, an update and it, it just magically gets downloaded to your account and you get 96 chart lists and uh, well over a thousand charts. So that's a plug for that. Um, it was interesting when Tom mentioned value. This is the opposite of value. This is not looking for value, catching falling knives, all those. Um, William O'Neill loves to say, you know, don't be, a, don't be afraid of leadership because, um, and I, I remember that was the case that, that I was really uh, reluctant years ago with looking at Amazon at 100 and 150, thinking, oh my gosh, it's extended. Well, uh, not so much at uh, 2000. So uh, we're, um, this is really the basis of the foundation of the, the tensile trading approach is where you're looking at um, the market and then you're moving from uh, assuming an, an uptrending market, looking at the strongest sectors. We have 11 sectors looking at which one's the strongest. And then moving, uh, as most of you know, the 11 sectors, each sector is broken down into industry groups. And then we're going to uh, look at strongest industry group and uh, look at the strongest stock in that strong industry group. So we're, we're really embracing this top-down uh, analysis, if you will. Um, I'm going to take you to uh, actually to the, uh, to the website and show you how this can be done very, very easily. So if we go here, and I can't believe this is a, a, a free tool, but we're going to be looking at the, uh, the 11 sectors, and we're gonna look at, let's say, uh, 
last 40 days or so. I, I, I like to see this, this kind of chart. So what I'm, what I'm seeing is clearly technology is strong and interesting. So I'm going to focus on technology. So if I go back here, the beauty of this is here we have all the, the uh, 11 sectors. We've just established that technology is the most interesting. If we click on, um, on the technology sector, we can see that um, which, uh, which industry groups make up technology. And we see that semiconductors is at the top of the list. So let's take a look at uh, the stocks that make up that industry group. And you can see here that they're sorted from uh, strength to weakness. We're actually gonna look at, uh, use the one month time frame. So you can see here, it's a, it's a, long, a long list of, of really terrific uh, stocks. We're gonna pick a couple of these and uh, show you how to build uh, uh, very sl slowly and, and piece by piece how to build these um, the Fab Four uh, approach, as I mentioned. So I've loaded a couple of these things into a chart. So this is, um, I like the name POW. This was one of the top performing stocks amongst its sisters in the semiconductor industry group, which we know is uh, part of the strongest sector technology. So this is how we build a uh, relative strength chart, the tensile trading approach. We're looking at it and you can see here that at, at one point the it was underperforming the market and I use VTI as the surrogate for the market as opposed to SPY or the S&P 500. The first step is to look at how is your equity performing relative to the market. And I, I'd sort of like to point out, I did these charts last Thursday. So it's, it's actually continued to uh, perform up and you can see it's, uh, it's moved up very, very strongly. The second thing we would want to look at is how is the sector technology performing relative to the market? So here we can see that the sector technology is indeed outperforming uh, the market. So we've got uh, two wins at our back, probability wins as I like to call it. Now we add the third chart and we ask the question, how is this particular industry which makes up the technology sector, how is it doing relative to the other industry groups in the technology sector and you can see this industry group so the brothers and sisters are all not all but as a group they're outperforming the technology um, sector and then finally we move down here and we see how is the stock of interest so power integrations is indeed look how it is outperforming its brothers and sisters in the semiconductor industry group. So there you have it very quickly, one, two, three, four. And then here's the chart that you pull up. If all you have to remember on, uh, on the website is actually my name, and you can pull this chart up, and you can see here that at this point, it's outperforming the market, the sector is strong, the industry group is uh, is outperforming the sector and the stock is outperforming its brothers and sisters. The other thing I like to look at is I'm, I'm a volume junkie, so I like to look at on-balance volume. And you can see that we have a very strong on-balance volume in this stock. Another um, stock that appeared in that list that I uh, just previously showed you was IPHI. And you can see that the same thing applies here, that at this point there was clearly a change in relative strength where the stock is outperforming the market, the sector we know, the industry group, and the equity itself is outperforming its brothers and sisters. And you can see how that, uh, that has done actually, uh, as I say, over the last week. Here's another stock that was uh, performing nicely uh, in that group that, uh, that I showed you of the uh, equities in the semiconductor uh, group. And you can see the same sort of thing happening 
And what you're doing here is you're aligning the probabilities, the winds of probability, you're putting them at your back. And it's, it's a much higher probability trade. You can see here too, that we're looking at on balance volume being uh, of interest. Micron's the last one I'll, I'll look at here in this group. And you can see again, the four winds of probability are blowing nicely. Here we've got a little overhead resistance, uh, but it's look at that money flow very, very um, attractive. So uh, the other thing that's, uh, that you can do on the flip side of uh, relative strength is you can look at stocks that are, uh, you can use it as a sell indicator or you can look uh, if, if you're looking for uh, something to, uh, to short, if you will. This is an example of taking that previous chart I showed you of the stocks in the semiconductor group and looking from the bottom up. So look, look what happens when you're looking at something like BP and you can see, yes, it's, it started to underperform, it's underperforming the market. The uh, energy, uh, actually I, I'm using, um, going back, well, I can, I can actually do that. I think if they don't kick me off the stage here, Quickly, I'll uh, I'll go back and show you why we why we picked that. So we're now looking for for weakness. So there you have you see how the energy group is is clearly uh, the weakest. That's 200 days. But if we go down to to be consistent down to the 40 days, it's still uh, it's it's still a pretty ugly. Uh, you can see energy is still pretty ugly. So if we go backwards and click on energy and now we're looking for the weakest group, and then you go into uh, let me try to catch up here on my notes. You go into the weakest stock, uh, the the weakest industry group. Then you can find a bunch of uh, really weak stocks, and then you're right back to uh, either looking for it, looking to short stocks or. Um, using the tool, that's really what I'm, I'm trying to show you here, that you can actually use the relative strength of Fab4 approach uh, for uh, a sell tool. So as it starts to deteriorate relative to the market, the sector's deteriorating, here you can see the industry group, and then the, the stock itself, BP, relative to its brothers and sisters, it's it's pretty clear that this de this deterioration has been happening for uh, a couple months now, and you can see here we've had a couple gaps down. So, from this the the Fab Four approach, you can use it on the downside. So, relative strength isn't necessarily something you have to think of just as as a positive. Here's Murphy Oil, and you can see it's been underperforming the market sector we know, and then the stock itself relative to its brothers and sisters. So, I, I, in our book, we talk about something called the triple when you get three lower peaks to sell. Um, well, here you can see you get a, a three lower peaks. It's like sell, ask questions later. You'll notice also the on balance volume is not very attractive. Next decade is another example. You can see how here at this line, if you start, it, it almost picks the very top. The deterioration is pretty obvious. The money flow is negative. It's it's a very powerful sell tool as well. In the first one, we were looking for the winds of probability on the upside. Here, what you have is the, the relative strength winds of negativism here coming in and saying, okay, let's, let's get out of this. Um, Repsol, the same thing. You can see all the deterioration in the Fab Four uh, chart that's going on and uh, the, the negative uh, money flow. So, there are some very specific steps that, that you can take. If you go to uh, any chart you want to put in, Misfit, that's a great uh, stock, one of my favorites. Um, since I'm sitting here in Redmond, I thought I might as well use Microsoft. So if you get a Microsoft stock, and if you can remember my name, uh, which I know is tough. Just go to the bottom of the list, pull up my name, click on that, and then there you get the Fab Four chart. So it's all 
pre-formatted for you, makes it very easy. Uh, hopefully anybody can, uh, can follow along there. Um, I'm going to go back to the, uh, to the uh, keynote. This is just showing you where to find, uh, find it under uh, chart styles. You can also use it, and I use this uh, the relative strength approach for ETFs and mutual funds. And I'll show you, I've written a lot about best of breed and, and how I use them. Um, I've also written about the fact that I have 20 asset classes that I maintain 19 of them are exclusively ETFs and mutual funds. One, which is large cap stocks, are my positions in Visa, Microsoft, Amazon, you know, those, those kinds of, those are the individual stocks that I buy. But for the others, how do you maintain, how do you decide um, which ETFs or mutual funds to buy? Well, I maintain charts. Here's an example of my mid cap chart. Um, the green line is always the market, VTI. The black line is always the, um, the symbol at the top, in this case, JKG, which is the Morningstar Midcap ETF. So the first question we're answering here is that uh, there are some very nice mid-cap mutual funds that are outperforming the ETF. So uh, we have those answered that question, and then... Um, I've owned a mutual fund for a long time, uh, prime cap, uh, aggressive growth. And you can see the orange line outperforms the market, outperforms the ETF, and it's on a relative strength basis. It's just where you want to be in the mid caps. Now, in this case, it's mutual funds. If we go to biotech, here we have XBI, which is an ETF, a basket of, of the best biotech companies. Once again, you can see what the green line is, the market. So how is biotech doing relative to the market? And then you can see um, the best mutual funds. How are they doing? Well, in this case, it's clear that the way to play this asset allocation category, in my case, this biotech, I play it using XBI because the relative strength of XBI is far superior to my other benchmarks. Another example would be healthcare. Here are, the, again, the black line is VHT, which is a, an ETF, Vanguard ETF. The green line you can see is uh, pretty close, but the, the top mutual funds are actually underperforming the ETF. So in the healthcare sector, I will admit I use a, a, a mixture of ETFs and mutual funds to cover this because healthcare is obviously a huge area. In small caps, you can see, again, the same way, you, where's, where's the market? Well, the market's very similar to the, the black line, which is IJT, which is the iShare small cap uh, growth index. But the thing that you're answering here is the uh, Vitus Fund is absolutely, hands down, the best small cap fund out there. And so that's where I put my money. And the, the fact that it's outperforming both the market and its ETF bogey makes it very attractive. So this is just showing you how to use and maintain um, relative strength charts for, uh, for your different asset classes. Because at this point in, in my life, I'm more of an asset allocator than a stock trader um, because I find that that's maybe the lifestyle that I prefer to lead. And also, the, uh, so much of your bang for your buck comes from making the right asset allocation decisions. Um, sometimes when you, when you own things like Visa, MasterCard, and Amazon, you, those are sort of one decision stocks. So you don't need to think too much about that. But so back to the book, I suggest if you buy it through stock charts, you uh, get a signed copy. If you buy it through Amazon, it's not signed. So there's a shameless plug for, for the book. Um, most of you, I hope, know that um, Grayson and I write a uh, journal since 2012. It's a, uh, the Trader's Journal, a blog. So uh, much of if you just go in and uh, under the search button there and say, well, let's find out some more on best of breed or relative strength. You're going to get a lot of different blogs uh, about that. 
Um, and, and then we have a, a website, uh, stockmarketmastery.com, where we announce uh, if we're doing boot camps or I'm actually doing a uh, two classes for local people in um, at Bellevue College in September. Um, come visit us on uh, Stock Market Mastery and you, you can register. We'll keep you uh, apprised of, uh, I, I was on the money show, I guess, a few a uh, few weeks ago, and just what's going on, and uh, the blogs are connected there, and uh, it's it's just it's an educational uh, website. So that is a quick summary. Hopefully, somebody has some uh, some good questions, and we'll uh, we'll take it away from there. So I'll uh, tr turn it back to our illustrious moderators. Yes. Uh, well, first of all, great presentation. Um, I completely agree with uh, just about everything you went over in the presentation. I know my charts are Okay, what well, don't you agree with? Let's get a that? debate. No, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, about the only thing different is I like to use, you know, the S&P as my benchmark, you use the Vanguard, but I mean, still not, not really a big deal. Um, but I, I think it's really helpful to see all of those different areas line up. I like the top-down approach. You get the market going up, best, uh, sector, best industry group, best stock within it. I think that that uh, will completely change people's, um, uh, their results if they're struggling with the market. I think that is a, a tremendous overall strategy. I, I think, Tom, you, because you are at sort of the top end, uh, the gold part of the market, um, that makes absolute sense. But the fact that I'm really covering all the way down to small caps, um, I don't buy them individually, but I, I, that is the reason I like using VTI as my surrogate as opposed to uh, SPY. It, right. It's just, it, it sort of covers everything and uh, that, that appeals to me where I am today. Years ago, I was like you, you know, you're a young guy, aggressive guy. Uh, SPY was my, my bogey, but I, I've changed over the years to VTI. Well, I appreciate the whole young guy comment. I don't know about that, but uh, appreciate. It. <laughs> <laughs> I did share some of my on that cruise that we went on. I, I did give you some of those anti-puberty pills of, of mine, and you <laughs> you really looked really good for the cruise. I, I thought you know I only gave you a week's worth, but <laughs> shh, shh. keep that to ourselves. Um, I, I had a couple questions for you, Gaddis. Uh, first, one of the stocks that you showed on your list, I think it was a semiconductor, P O W I. Yes, sir. Um, and one thing I noticed on that chart was that a lot of days, the volume, the daily volume was under 100,000 shares. Do you not care about the volume when you find stocks that are outperforming? Do you not care at all about the, the liquidity? I mean, it's, it's obviously liquid. It's just not as liquid as many other stocks. Just Actually, you just, you just hit it on. The 100,000 is sort of the, I don't want to say break even, but um, I, do, I never buy anything under... 10 bucks and I generally don't trade stuff that's trading under a hundred thousand. It's just, uh, I've been bitten in the past and I don't, uh, uh again, I'm not an institution. I'm not going to move the market. Uh, so, and I, I, I don't use on, on generally I don't use market orders. So, um, it, yes, it's a concern. I do look at it. I was using it more for clarity in the sense of, showing the, the way that uh, stock charts user can step down, answer the question, you know, what's the trend, but then go to that sector chart, that perf chart and say, you know, what, what are the sectors, if you're trading timeframes, let's say 40 days or a month or so, what sectors are, are outperforming? And, and I made a case for technology. Then I wanted the people to understand that you can tech, click on technology and get all the industry groups that make up that sector. That that's pretty slick. There's nobody on the web that I found that you can do that and then go and click on, uh, on that industry group and, um, uh, show you all the stocks in, in that industry group, um, and then go through them. So it's a very methodical, rational, reasonable approach, I guess. And then if you, as I say, if, if you can remember my name and just pull down the chart, then it makes it really simple. Put in any ticker and it automatically comes up. And I believe that's a, a free, a freebie feature on stock charts. It's not, you don't even have to be a subscriber for that. 
God, they give stuff away here. <laughs> yeah. And I'm a fan. I always talk about those relative charts. I like to see everything moving up from left to right. As long as everything's moving up from left to right, then I know that I'm zeroing in on the right types of stocks to own. Yeah, hallelujah. I, I showed the, the negative charts. I don't short anymore. I actually don't use options, don't do futures. It's just a lifestyle choice for me. I, you know, I don't want to be going to church and saying, uh, you know, dear God, please make Apple go down on, on Monday. So I, I, I wanted to show that, that the relative strength can, can be used, uh, yes, on the uptrends, but it also can be used if you want to short the market and a great indicator um, of when it's starting to deteriorate and you want to uh, look for sort of the cell bells going off and your probabilities start drifting down and it's like, okay, it's, it's time to get out of this thing. You know, you've got all four charts here downtrending. All right. Well, I've got another question for you, and I'm going to bring this one up on a screen so everybody can look at this. I know when you talked about relative strength earlier, and you were just using an example, but you pulled up 40 days. And I was looking, this is a the XLK versus the S&P 500. And you can see like back at, in April into the early part of June, we had this relative downtrend in technology. But of course, the market was coming down. And the same thing back in October through December we had technology underperforming, but the market was coming down. How do you factor in when you're looking at relative strength of a sector, let's say, how do you factor in, you know, just a normal correction versus say the start of a bear market? When you, when you start to see this, when does it get worrisome for you when technology is underperforming, let's say? I would send viewers, uh, listeners back to that first um, chart or, or, or uh, chart list that I, showed about um, where I mentioned you start from a, a telescope and go down to the microscope level. It, it really depends on the trading time frame that you personally have. And one of the things I did years ago, I presented a chart, uh, a particular chart to the class. We had, I think, about 115 students. And I said, okay, we're going to trade a long-term chart of, I'm just making trying to remember Apple, let's say. And it, what was interesting was that um, I had eight charts of eight different time frames, and said, okay, where would you buy this? Where would you sell it if you were a long-term investor? And then all the way down to short term. And it was interesting that uh, there were these crazy engineers from Boeing that loved to day trade. So their time frame was they loved that uh, one minute data, 20, 20 day charts. But about an eighth of the class were really long-term traders. And, and some of these blips that you, like you just asked me about, they would ride those through because they know that they're long-term traders. So really, uh, when if you go to a cocktail party and, and you're a, a long-term trader and you run into a day trader, you, you guys really need to identify what your trading time frame is before you start asking for advice or comparing notes. Because I, I have a, a good friend, and this actually happened at a cocktail party. My good friend, Harvey Baraban, is a, is a day trader. So he was telling Brenda at the party that a core position for him was square. And so she tells me in class next, uh, next Wednesday that, oh, she bought some on Tuesday. She bought some square because Harvey had said it was a core position. Well, you have to understand, Harvey's a day trader. For him, a core position is something that he held over the weekend. So he was selling his stock on Tuesday to her. So it's it's really critical that you understand yourself and what your trading time frame is um, to really answer these kinds of questions that you asked. Boy, yeah. I guess I threw it back in your court, didn't I? Well, that's okay because I, I got a response. So <laughs> what I what I looked at and what I've been finding is, and I, I've I've used relative strength more in my uh, trading and analysis. I mean, I've always used it, but I've been using it a lot more over the course of probably the last year. Um, and one of the things, that, and that it's now my chart style on here that I use the stock charts and all. Um, but one of the things I've noticed is that when you're in, when you're in some of the best stocks within the best industries, within the best sector, and the sector goes down, Sometimes those great stocks within that sector still manage to hang in there because they are among the best. They levitate. They yes. levitate. 
Yes. And, and that, that doesn't mean that you need to, to liquidate your positions, but you have to understand that the stock market is a probability game. And so you have to understand that the probabilities now have diminished. So why not take some money off the table and look good? Yep. So it's, it's all a matter of, as I say, I, I spend more of my time now as an asset allocator because I'm moving money from one big basket to another based on the kinds of things that you're talking about. Right. So it, know your time frame, use it to, to rejigger your, the size of your baskets and understand that it's all a probability game. So when that thing starts to, I mean, I showed you ideal four ideal semiconductor charts that the, the wind is at your back because all four of the relative strength charts are aligned when they start to disintegrate or deteriorate a bit, you know, take some money off the table. It's okay. It feels good. Buy a new car. Um, that's what I seem to do. You have larger positions than me because for me, uh, yeah, yeah. for me, if when I take something off the table, I just get like a Chipotle burrito or something. <laughs> <laughs> you should live in Seattle. Oh gosh. Uh, there is. <laughs> Honestly, Seattle is, I wrote a blog about this uh, a while ago that this, uh, unfortunately he passed away with cancer, but uh, his wife bought four positions. And in the last five years, uh, the blog explains she got into four local stocks, Seattle stocks that she can go and attend the annual meetings and read about, you know, Amazon and Microsoft are always on the front page of the newspaper here. And her position went, he left her $900,000 and five years later now she's over 5 million. Um, and you know, she's a retired school teacher. Mm -hmm. I can't say she's an astute investor, but she's an astute investor. And she goes to all those meetings and raises her hand and asks questions. She's, she's really enjoying it. It's great. So move to, move to Seattle. (laughs) <laughs> that's the answer well it's been great having you on here Gaddis I uh, really appreciate you taking your time to, to join us this week it's a big week relative strength I know you obviously use it quite a bit in everything you do and uh, I'm a big cheerleader big cheerleader yep absolutely so thanks again for joining us and come back and see us again soon uh, will do thanks uh, Tom thank you Aaron thank yes. you <laughs> alright there he goes great there presentation goes. yep all right, Aaron, you ready? I am ready. Of course, I've been working busily in the background, taking everybody's comments or stock symbol requests from the chat room. And as you can see, it's, you know, we've got this outlier. So really, you kind of want to, you know, move in a little bit. And that way you can see what's actually going on. So, you know, I thought it was interesting. Lots of, you know, movement to the Northeast, which is what uh, Julia says we need to be looking for. Uh, Some of those in the weakening moving to the Northeast are certainly especially interesting. And uh, sector wise, wow, look at the, look at the technology requests. That's pretty much half. And while they generally dominate our requests, um, this is pretty, uh, a lot of those, and especially industrials, we use, you know, didn't used to get a lot of them, but with uh, the Dow outperforming the S&P 500, not a surprise to see some of them on there. So let's go ahead and start with PCAR. Sounds good. Uh, PCAR, um, I think it's just consolidating. You can see its relative strength had been deteriorating for about two, two and a half months. I think it hit an important level though, and it's starting to bounce off of it. So I would watch that relative strength area. Key support, I think is pretty clear to me around 65 and a half up to 67. We've got multiple lows at that area, so we want to watch that. To the upside, you want to break out. So anything above 73, especially with volume picking up, would be bullish. All right. Next one up, the most popular in the chat room is Great Lakes Dredge and Dock Corporation, and that is GLDD. Yeah, this is one that I think I had put out as a setup a while back. Stock made a nice breakout. I think continues in this uptrend. Uh, good volume trends. I think the overall strength, relative strength, as you look across, for the most part, is good. Its industry group has just been kind of so-so, but this has been a leader within the group. So I like the stock. I think that the pullback recently creates uh, an opportunity here. I would maybe be watching these recent lows. So I'm going to say between about 10.10 and 10.30 or so to the downside. My target would be up around 11.70. But volume trends are good. Relative strength's good. I, I like it. All right. Next one up is uh, Netflix. 
All right. Netflix. It's an interesting chart, you know, with that gap down. Uh, yeah, I really don't like Netflix. I had a conversation with, um, I think we had a thing with um, Mary Ellen, and we were looking at this stock versus that stock or something. It was Netflix versus Disney, and I went with Disney. And the reason was literally Netflix. I think it was the day we were right up here in the 380s, and there was just so much resistance there. And when you look at Netflix at that point in time when we were up here, well, you can see that the relative strength was actually deteriorating. And we're, we're six months away uh, you know, from having Netflix at a relative high. Uh, look at the volume coming in. This was after earnings. I don't like it. I think that this one's got a lot of technical repair to go through. I think that Roku looks better. I think Disney looks better. Um, I think you've got uh, a bunch of overhead resistance between about 320 and 335. So I pass on it. All right. This is one we haven't looked at. Uh, Neural Stem Incorporated. And don't ask me why their symbol is C-U-R, but it is. C-U-R, Neural, Neural Stem. stem. Perfect sense. Yeah. All right. Absolutely. Well, this is the opposite of what uh, Gaddis was just talking about and also opposite of what I generally look for. Um, but let's pull this up and just show you what I'm talking about. So obviously price action is going down. The market's going up. So I think you know that we're probably not in a, a good spot here. Biotechs have been going down. The stock's been going down. It's actually a relative laggard uh, relative to the S&P setting a new 52-week low. And now bi biotechs continue setting new lows. So this is literally the exact opposite of what I want to see. Now, is this a great value? I don't know. And personally, for my taste, I don't care. This is not the type of stock that I would be interested in, so I'll pass. All righty. Next one up is in the trucking industry, Knight Swift Transportation, and that is KNX. Oops. Hit wrong. I thought it was KNT. All right, KNX. Well, I can tell you, I do like what's been going on in this space, and you can see that this stock is a leader. So, and the volume has been strong on this push up. I think there is accumulation taking place here. The group is finally starting to show really nice strength. We're at about a three month relative high. I think this is, it still might be a little early, but if I was going to get in, I'd want to get in with a leader. And I think right here, you've got the breakout, you've got nice volume and KNX certainly is a leader. You can see relative to the truckers. So I think you got a good one. I like it. All right. Uh, from the commercial vehicles area of the industrials, Meritor, MTOR. Yeah, this group uh, was really struggling for a while. I think I saw it bouncing back today or last couple of days. Yeah, it's held the 50-day moving average. I think we've got some sideways consolidation going on, but the relative strength here I think remains really good. So the problem, again, is the group. It's kind of like biotechs. If the group's going down, it's just less money going into the group. But mTOR has been a very, very solid stock within the group. I think volume trends still remain pretty solid. So I think what I would be doing is maybe watching for a return trip to test this, this prior high around 25, 60 or so. A breakout above that would be really bullish. All right. And I think this chart looks pretty tasty, as they say. Uh, Xilinx. And it, right now we're getting ready to cover up that April gap. It's popped up through resistance. Yeah, they report tonight. So that's mm -hmm. I'm just going to throw that out there as a, 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 pro, a possible problem. Now, this thing has really been moving. I like the way it's going. The, stock, the group, the semiconductors are on fire. Xilinx the last three months, I mean, Gaddis just showed you several semiconductors outperforming. Xilinx is just kind of going up along for the ride. And the last big move was down here. I'm on a fence. I'd be a little nervous holding it into earnings. Um, you know, the longer term chart, if we went back another year, I think Xilinx has been a really good stock. Maybe this was just a little bit of an aberration here. But there is your gap resistance. We're now moving into it. Selling was on very heavy volume. The buying has been on a lot less. So, yes, the stock's going up with the group. I'm a little nervous about this report uh, coming into today or to, uh, to tonight. So I would, I, I would probably be in another stock within mm -hmm. the semi space. I like other areas better. You make a great case. All right. Uh, next one is a software company, Stoneco, S-T-N-E. All right, Stone Co. Um, well, I mean, it's here you can see the software group going up. 
but Stone Co. relative to the group started to show a little strength with volume and is pulling back. I would just say this. It, there's so many other stocks that are looking better on a relative basis. If I got excited because of that volume coming in and the fact that it has started to outperform, this first test of the 20-day should hold. So I'd keep a tight stop right there. Uh, you can see the 20-day was holding back at the end of June, early July. I'd look for a quick uh, rally from this point. If it doesn't, I'd get out of it. All right. Maxar Technologies, M-A-X-R. Yeah, this one I believe was a scooter mover of the day not that long ago. Stock did make a nice breakout, good volume. It's pulled back on lesser volume. Below the 20-day, I would have expected it to hold the 20-day, to be honest. And you see the relative strength versus telecom, not very good. So I think the, the scooter move was probably back at the beginning of July. And now we've pulled back. We've held 750. And that's a level with that 50-day moving average sitting there that I would want to see hold. So I would say right there, close below the 50-day moving average um, would be a problem. If you're looking to get in, I think this is a pretty decent area with potentially a couple dollars upside and uh, you know maybe 50, 60 cents downside. All right. Uh, property Casualty Insurance, First American, FAF. All right. And this is the last one, correct? It is the last one. All right. FAF, a nice uh, rally here. Good volume coming in. Relative strength starting to build again. Um, there's probably others in the group that I'd, I'd prefer better, but this one is certainly improving. It's probably another one where I would just keep a tight stop. I mean, if it's... Uh, if the relative strength continues and the group continues to perform pretty well, then we shouldn't see drops back below the 20 day. Now the 20 is above the 50. I think we're holding that level. I'd keep my top, my uh, stop pretty tight there. And I'd probably have a short term target at about 57 and a half to challenge that April high and see whether or not we can get through. If we do get through heavy volume would be very bullish. All right, and that does complete the 10 and 10 to 1. These are the symbols that Tom just annotated. They will be up after the show into the Market Watchers Live chart list. Just go to the Articles tab, click on the Market Watchers Live blog, and the link to that live chart list is right there at the top. All right, we will be back with the market update and scooter report after this. Miss the live show? Want to rewatch a workshop? Tune into the Stock Charts TV YouTube channel to catch up on the latest programming and content. All of our live shows, workshops, special guests, and more can be found there. Each category has its own playlist, so it's easy to locate. We even have chart school and creative strategy videos to help you become a better technical trader. Leave comments for our commentators, like your favorite videos, and don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel. For our final market update, negative day for the Dow, but it is really the only one suffering. And as Tom had talked about earlier, uh, the earnings came in and a couple of those stocks uh, weren't doing so well on the earnings. And it's certainly put a drag on the Dow. It is currently down 110 points. And S&P 500, NASDAQ, all of these are looking pretty healthy here. Really like seeing this move on the mid caps and especially the Russell 2000. This is a great sh uh, showing right now. We really need them to pick up so that we can put some oomph behind this rally and we're starting to see that. Treasury yields are lower, currently at 2.058%. The VIX is continuing to slide over the last three days, a pretty much uh, a defined declining trend going on there. We are now seeing a reading of 12.21. UUP is uh, down slightly, one cent, 26.45. Gold, GLD, is up. It had a nice gap up, but has been pulling back some of those gains uh, throughout the rest of the trading day. USO, uh, quite a rocky morning, and you've got currently the prices are down almost a quarter percent for USO. Despite this rising trend, we've started to see this week and into last week. TLT, big gap up here and consolidating sideways for the most part at 131.51. And that's all I have for the final market update. Back to you. All right. I just wanted to pull up the uh, bank index to check that out because I mentioned earlier it was uh, up against a key resistance area. 
And when we look back late April, early May, we got up to about 465, couldn't get through. You can see multiple tops in October and November, early December around 460. This is good news. I mean, we're, we're seeing the PPO back up above the center line. The pullback came back, held the 20 day moving average, now moving back to the upside. Banks are starting to look better on an absolute basis. They're still struggling on a relative basis, but if they keep moving up like this, I think their relative strength will start to improve as well. So banks are an area that I would maybe at least begin starting to take a look at, but focus on the leaders in the group. All right, time for the scooter report. And uh, Aaron, what do you have for the scooters today? All right, uh, perfect for relative strength week, I would say. I'm gonna go ahead and go into the scooter report uh, itself today. Uh, you can find that from the member tools over here all the way down here to the scooter reports, but also a real quick way to get to them is from our charts and tools. And you can see it's right there on that page as well. So what I wanted to do is I picked this up and I wanna look at one of the things that I look for when I'm, I'm looking for trading opportunities uh, in my scooter scan, I guess you could call it, is to find, uh, you know, strong stocks that are really looking in their 60s to 80s with room to run, you know, to the upside, but they're, they are, you know, starting to show some internal strength. That's why they have scooters between 60 and 80. So I thought I would just pull up a few of those that I found interesting. And, um, you know, we've talked about GE. I just did United Airlines. Let's look at uh, Philips 66. And you can see really nice move. Price uh, is starting to kind of roll over at this point, but we now have this 5,200 day EMA crossover and it looks like it will go final today. That means we're moving out of a uh, bear market configuration into a bull market configuration. And you know, this part of the market energy, uh, you know, I'm sure I can pull up Tom's relative chart here. And as you can see, as far as the industry group, you know, flat performing about the same as the S&P 500, but look at Phillips on this move and they are, it is outperforming quite a bit, uh, especially when you look at the, the group itself against the S&P, it's, uh, you know, on decline. So of those, you know, that would be a good one. Now I found that, re remember, I found that right off of our scooter reports right here. And I mean, there's obviously lots to choose from here. And uh, let's look at Constellation Brands. That's in the space of the consumer staples. And there's that scooter. It's starting to move toward the hot zone here. Not as thrilled with this scooter just because it is, uh, you know, moving a bit sideways right now. Uh, but we're getting a nice rising trend on the scooter. Volume is meh. I guess I would say we're on a PMO buy signal and it is moving up. Uh, we do see a possible wedge here. So while this one has that scooter at 72.6, which gives it a relative strength reading against uh, the other large caps in its area, that you know tells us that there are others that might be having more strength out there that we might wanna look at instead of this one. So again, let's go back and look at that scooter rankings chart again. Uh, let's go with a T-Mobile. Let's see what's going on with that because it has just moved up 16 on the scooter and it's headed for that hot zone. Uh, volume, you know, we had the, uh, likely I would think that's an earnings uh, report uh, volume bar there. Uh, you know, we, so it really pulled that OBV way up. Uh, and since then we've seen a lot of distribution going on here, uh, but it looks like it, it's ready to, to move again. It's broken out above these short-term tops and you know it's still got this resistance at 81 though we'll have to see if that can can uh, be surpassed i'm guessing it will just because i've got the b the pmo buy signal and i always like to see these um, bull kisses i guess is what i call them it comes down looks like it's going to give you a sell signal and then it turns back up and you get that uh, bottom above the signal line. And I, I find that those usually are, are a really good um, measure of what might be coming along. Just as these tops below the signal line, it's just the opposite. And when those start to happen, 
uh, you know, that's giving us warning that something's going on here. And sure enough, we ended up with that really deep price to, price drop back in March. So those were the ones I was going to uh, show. I, what are you looking at right now as far as the scooter reports? Well, I thought I would start with a group that has been uh, a group that I've talked about now for a couple months that has been showing a lot of uh, relative strength and it's starting to pick back up again. And so I'm going to talk a little bit about the defense group. So one way I know that the defense group or any group is starting to strengthen is I've got my relative strength industries here. Um, and so it's, it's telling me on a relative basis to the S&P 500, which ones are making the biggest moves on a percentage basis. And you can see now there's over 100 in the list. And you can see here in the top 10, first 10 is defense stocks. And this has been a common theme of late. Now, we had pulled back since the beginning of June, but now we're starting to see that relative strength build up again. Defense stocks had been underperforming for about a year. And when it, one of the things I look at, when that PPO, the relative PPO goes negative, that's a little bit of a warning sign. When the relative price action goes below both the 20 and the 50, that's a warning sign. When the 20 drops below the 50 and price is below the 20, that's a warning sign. But we start getting positive signals when the opposite happens. Here we had a double bottom, came back up. We cleared that prior top, which I think confirms the bottom. We've got the breakout on a relative basis above the 50 and the 20. That occurred back in May. The 20 crosses above uh, the 50 in June. And you can see the, the relative PPO turns positive back in May. So I think that there was a character change taking place in the defense group back in May. And as a result, it's been an area that I've been trading. Now, when we get into the group, um, you can then go into, say, the scooter reports. And what I would do is look at this, pull up my scooter report here. And then under large cap stocks, just type in defense. And look how quickly I, I've got Northrop Grumman, Lockheed Martin, and Huntington Ingalls Industries. Those are the three top large cap defense stocks. And if I want the mid cap, look how fast that happened. Uh, ESLT, which I'm not going to talk about. Look at the volume there. Uh, Curtis Wright, a little bit more volume, but these don't tend to have a whole lot of volume. And then if I do small cap, a uh, stock that I've talked about a lot and currently own, which is Kratos Defense, KTOS, sitting right up there at the top, 95.5. Um, your stock that you had for this week's uh, Monday setup, Aaron, mm -hmm. Axon Enterprise having a really good week. I know it was really having a good day today. It's in the defense group and it's one of the higher scooter ranks. So I, this is how I would be using the scooter. I find a group I like. I'd go into the scooter reports, type in into the search box. And literally, if, it's, if it doesn't come up in scooter order, or if you don't see the scooter, make sure under columns here that the scooter appears because it could be something like this. If you go in, you don't see scooter. It's because for some reason it's not, you haven't clicked on it. So make sure the scooter appears and then you can just simply click on that column to make the highest come to the top. Um, and as far as looking at some of these charts, I'll just pull up a couple of them here. Northrop, Northrop Grumman just reported earnings, big breakout. Uh, here's defense stocks breaking out to a new high by the, by the way. Um, I think maybe I should show that. I think that's really important to know because not only is it outperforming on a relative basis, but those who follow breakouts on an absolute basis are seeing defense stocks breaking out today. So you've got a number of folks maybe jumping in that are following the breakout. You got a lot of folks who follow relative strength who already know defense stocks have been leading uh, uh, that are into their positions. And so you're not going to see a whole lot of selling going on. You're going to see a lot more buying. So I think that is something to keep in mind. Uh, here, like I said, is Northrop Grumman, which has been a leader, breaking to a new relative high. And I uh, went through a number of them, but I'll just give you one more here, which is KTOS. Again, I own this one, full disclosure. Stock's down a little bit today, but it's been a tremendous performer. And look what happened in May when all of these things were taking place. Kratos blew away their earnings estimates, revenue estimates, raised guidance, a lot of folks jumping in, and this stock has continued to perform very well over the last couple of months. So it's one way how you, you know, to use the scooter report. Once you know an area that you want to look for, go in, pull up the scooter report, type it into that search box, and it brings all the stocks in that group up for you. So there is your 
summary for what we just covered on the scooter report. And now, I guess as a preliminary or I'm not sure what we want to call it, but we've got Julius de Kempenar joining us along with Arthur Hill tomorrow. And so why not talk a little bit about RRG to kind of prep for, I'm sure, what uh, Julius will be talking about. But RRG analysis, what do you have in terms of RRG, Aaron? All right. Well, let's go ahead and take a look. Uh, you know, I use it uh, oh, frequently, I'll say, the RRGs. And I think the, the one thing I really enjoy about using them, and again, you can find the RRG charts, uh, if I can see it, there it is, right here from Member Tools, or again, you can go to our Charts and Tools page, and it's right there. You can see it right away. So I really am enjoying that. When you open it up, it's just pretty much going to set you up with the S&P 500. And it's considered the benchmark. So when we add stocks or we add the sectors, which I'm going to do into this, it makes a comparison to relative strength in regard to the S&P 500. Uh, now, he showed us how you can do a dollar one like this. And that would make it uh, straight up price that you're you're comparing, not necessarily the relative uh, strength as uh, against the S and P 500. But I'm going to stick with the way he does it, the way I use it as well. And then over here, you can select all different kinds of uh, setups here. I'm going to start with the sector ETFs, and then somebody had asked about healthcare for the 10 and 10, so I will look at that as well. But let's start off with the sector ETFs. Let's see, we'll go over here, same thing. Gonna go to charts and tools and RRG charts. And here we go, uh, just switched my browser, that worked out well. So right now when you bring it up, it's gonna show you just the major, these major indices against the S&P 500. And you know, I think that it's interesting so that you can get an idea of you know, where the strength really lies and you know, Julia says often that you want to find those Northeast travelers, and that gives you an indication that they are improving and getting ready to lead as far as their relative strength along the RRG chart. So I'm going to go ahead, and like I said, I'll look at the sector ETFs RRG right now. And as you can see, the strength, uh, in, and this is a more intermediate to long-term picture. You can shorten it up by moving it to a daily. We'll go ahead and look at that as well. So in the short term right now, we're looking at as far as Northeast travelers, um, the best ones right now are technology and financials in a shorter term picture. Materials and industrials are also getting ready to lead here. All right, so what we're looking for here is, and we're gonna go to XLV members, and yeah, quite a bit here, but uh, you can click on them like this and just get an idea of who's in leading and what direction they're going. And it's just one more way for you to compare the relative strength of a group of stocks or even industries. So um, what are you gonna be looking at right now? I'm gonna take a look at uh, semiconductors. Um, semiconductors have been really strong. And so I thought what I would do is maybe show everyone how you can, it'll kind of follow up a little bit, I guess, on, on what uh, Gaddis had talked about too, starting with the, the uh, you know, top-down kind of approach. Um, so let's take a look first at technology relative to the S&P 500. So here you can see, um, and th this is just a very simple um, RRG where I just have XLK as a symbol, and I've got the S&P 500 as the benchmark. And this is back at the beginning of the year. This is a one year daily. Now notice when we're in an uptrend, notice what happens to the XLK when we're trending higher. When we're trending higher, it tends to stay on the right side of the chart. But when we're trending lower, it tends to stay on the left half of the chart in the lagging area. As Soon as we get to the bottom in uh, late fourth quarter, you can see things started to change. And then as we moved into the huge rally, See how we stay way on the right side of the, the screen? That is normally a very bullish sign. As long as the technology group is performing well relative to the S&P, that's good. But look at the very top back in late April, early May, as we were making this uh, rollover. Look at the XLK quickly 
decelerate and move back over into the lagging area. Then as soon as we get to the bottom at uh, in, uh, I guess I would have been late uh, May, early June, look at what happens at the very, very beginning of this uptrend. The XLK comes roaring back. So that is the relative strength. I mean, we're talking from a top-down approach. So the S&P 500 rallies, you look to the strong sectors, it's the XLK. Now I'm looking at semiconductors on this chart relative to technology. And this is, this is a volatile group. Um, and actually, let me max this out here. No. Okay, there we go. So now you can see during the weakness, we were doing okay. And then during the strength, we stayed mostly on the right side of this chart leading. When, this, when the market struggled, look at what happens here, May, April and May, semiconductors got absolutely crushed. And when we got to the bottom, look at this group roaring back and back into the leading area. So now we've got technology leading, we've got semiconductors over here on the right side of the chart. And so that leads me to individual stocks within semiconductors. Now, what I did is I went back to those scooter reports that Aaron and I looked at, and I just typed in semiconductors for large cap, mid cap, and small cap stocks. And I took some of the leaders, the top scooter reports. I think they're probably all above like 94, 95 in terms of their scooter score and put them on a chart here with the semiconductors. And now as we go through this, you can see that in the downtrend, eh, it's kind of a mixed bag, not so great. But when things started to improve, look at how almost every one of them are above or are on the right side of the chart until we get right near the top and then we roll back over, start turning lower. And now during the rally, you can see this group has really been leading in this, this uh, rally. And that's why you're seeing all of these, many of these symbols moving toward the far end. I mean, we're talking about some major um, outperformance here when you start talking about the relative strength ratio getting out to 120 and 125. These are some really big numbers. So what do those charts look, look like? Let's take a look at these three, IPHI, MU, and SGH. So the first one, let's pull up IPHI. And I believe this was one also that Gaddis had looked at on a rel relative chart that I like to use. Look at the movement on this stock to the upside. It's been straight up. Look at the volume. As Gaddis said, don't be afraid of the leaders and relative strength. This is what you want. You want to find stocks that are outperforming. This is how you beat the S&P 500. Um, IPHI has been a great one. Another one, Micron and SGH. So let's pull up Micron. Micron. Now, Micron strength has come here in the last month. Since the earnings came out, they were able to get back up, break above 44. And look at the relative strength now. Got a little bit more work to do, but very close to about a nine-month relative high versus semiconductors. And it's coming on heavy volume. That's a clue to me that it's not going to stop anytime I see that. Uh, SGH. This is Smart Global Holdings. Another one, look at the volume coming in. That's a, to me, volume is really important because if I saw this gaining relative strength, but I didn't see volume coming in, I don't know that I would pay nearly as much attention to it. But this is a stock that had been underperforming very badly. And then all of a sudden, when the volume comes in at the end of June, we break the downtrend. So we've got a character change on the chart. And now look at the relative strength. If you had seen that, Back when the volume started picking up and we started to show, you know, a three month relative high, this stock has gone up another 50% almost in a month since that uh, time. So this is a stock that clearly is being accumulated. Now it's getting close to overhead resistance. I'd probably be a little bit more cautious, but that's just a quick and dirty way of using the RRG to analyze a group. First of all, if you like the market, you look to see what sectors outperforming the XLK, what area of the market, semiconductors, and here are nine stocks within the semiconductors, kind of building a little bit on what Gaddis talked about earlier in the show. All right, that is it for our RRG analysis. Um, you'll see the summary slide there um, going over what we had talked about, some of the stocks I covered. And so next up is the poll. And um, I'm interested, you know, we've talked a lot this week about relative strength. And the question is, 
which of the following in the poll were not, which ones were not um, indications to help you in terms of relative strength. And the audience got it right. Uh, the top two are not um, signs to help you, or they're not, uh, you can't really compare relative performance using either of those two. And I'm assuming you got that one right too, Aaron. Yes, I think so. Uh, I mean, a lot of people don't know. It's very interesting. A lot of people don't know that the PPO and the PMO are actually, you know, um, they can be used for relative strength analysis because you can compare their values uh, to each other. MACD, you can't. I mean, it's really very similar information. I mean, when you see those lines on the chart, they look almost identical, um, but it's the values that are the problem. Yeah, PPO and PMO use percentages and MACD uses the actual absolute dollar difference. So the problem with the MACD is if you've got a stock like um, Amazon, you know, close to 2000, then you're looking at Sirius, um, you know, which is maybe what, I don't even know what that is. I haven't looked at stock in forever, five, $6, whatever it is. The MACD is based on the difference between the moving averages expressed in dollars. So you can't look at a stock that's $2,000 versus a stock that's five and compare them. But you can with the PPO and PMO because they're percentage differences. So if one stock's got a PPO, for instance, of two, it's telling you its short-term moving average is 2% above its longer-term moving average. Where if another stock's got a PPO of one, it means that it's only 1% above. So you could compare in that fashion. Um, but the others, uh, price relative indicator, um, RRG charts, scooters, those are all ways that you can use uh, you can look to relative strength, and that's what we've been showing so far this week, and we will continue tomorrow. All right, we've got Julius and Arthur coming on tomorrow. I'm really excited. That'll be a fun show. Um, oh, we'll yeah. do a panel-type discussion, so looking forward to seeing them. Yeah, panels are always great. One of my favorite things to do here on the show, so I'm looking forward to it. Yep. Shows a lot of contrasting styles, which I think everybody enjoys. Mm -hmm. All right. I uh, want to thank all of you for being with us today. Um, please remember to complete the survey as you exit. It's located below the video player. We'd love to get your feedback. We always like to hear what you think of Market Watchers Live. As a quick reminder, Market Watchers Live airs five days a week, Mondays through Fridays from noon to 1.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Have a great Wednesday afternoon, everybody. Remember, tomorrow, Julius and Arthur coming back with us. Happy trading.